the Minnesota Vikings aren't leaving Minnesota anytime soon. In 2016, U.S. Bank Stadium opened up, and aside from the fact that the venue is gorgeous and has received near-critical acclaim, the team's lease doesn't expire until 2046. And last year, the Vikings opened up a state-of-the-art 277,000 square foot trading facility less than half an hour away from Minneapolis. After 60 years in Minnesota, it's hard to imagine the Vikings anywhere else. And that certainly is going to be the case for, at minimum, the next three decades. But that wasn't always the case. Because before these venues opened up, they almost moved to Birmingham. Twice. This is the story or rather the stories, of how the Vikings nearly moved to Alabama, and then nearly moved to Alabama again. Our story begins before the Vikings even came into existence. It begins with a different sport entirely, baseball. In 1953, after 81 seasons in Boston, the Braves relocated to Milwaukee. There were two reasons for the move. The first was low attendance. But the second and more important reason was the fact that Milwaukee had just constructed a brand new baseball stadium called Milwaukee County Stadium, which was designed specifically to lure a Major League Baseball team. At the time, Minnesota didn't have a pro baseball team, so taking notes from Milwaukee, they decided to build their own stadium called Metropolitan Stadium in hopes of luring an MLB team. The venue opened up in 1956, and eventually, the plan worked, as the Washington Senators would move to Minnesota in 1961 to become the Minnesota Twins. When the NFL placed a team in Minnesota for the start of the 1961 season, there was one small problem. The Met was not exactly a football venue. There was a whole myriad of problems with the stadium, so I'll try and sum up the highlights as best that I can. Number one. Because of its baseball configuration, the sight lines weren't that great. The Vikings had to add a set of bleachers in left field, which looked so out of place compared to the rest of the ballpark. And to illustrate this, as you might be able to tell from the pictures, there was no concourse or pathway to get from the bleachers to the grandstand. So if you were in the left field bleachers, and you had a friend who was sitting behind home plate, and you wanted to go to your seat and then converse with him during pregame warm-ups, you literally would have had to leave the stadium and re-enter. Imagine if you were at an airport, went to your gate, and then decided you wanted to eat at one of the restaurants inside the airport. Now imagine that you had to leave the airport and go through TSA security again just to do that. That's what getting around at the Met was like. Number two. The stadium was pretty small by NFL standards. As part of the AFL-NFL merger, Commissioner Pete Rozelle pretty much mandated that each team play in a stadium that seats at least 50,000 people. This caused a problem for some teams, including the New England Patriots, who nearly moved away because Fenway Park was deemed too small by NFL standards. And Metropolitan Stadium couldn't be expanded anymore. Its capacity at slightly under 50,000 was pretty much fixed in its current configuration. So this was a pretty big problem. And number three, the team wasn't drawing great crowds late in the season due to the cold weather. Not only was the Met an outdoor stadium in Minnesota, but because of its design, it didn't do a good job keeping the wind out. This made for some absolutely brutal games and the fans stayed home later in the season because of it. I looked at the attendance data for the Vikings each year, from 1973 to 1979. And right around mid-November, you can notice a fairly sharp dip in attendance. Keep in mind that each year except for 1979, the Vikings had a winning record. So you can attribute these numbers to the fact that they played meaningless football games, because this was not the case. And here's every regular season game the Vikings played at the Met, with a temperature below freezing during that time frame. And this doesn't even take into account wind chill factor. For example, this 1978 game between the Eagles and the Vikings had a temperature of 16 degrees 
but with wind chill taken into account, it was only one degree at kickoff. There was also this game between the Vikings and the 49ers in 1977, with a wind chill of minus two. You get the picture. It was awfully cold, and the weather wasn't doing the team any favors when it came to the box office. At this point, it was clear that the Vikings needed a new domed stadium, and their threat if they didn't get one, they were going to move to Birmingham. Now what I find most interesting about this article is that there were reports that the Vikings wanted to move to New York. A third team in New York could be an interesting topic for a future video. But as for the Birmingham rumor, there was a lot more merit behind it. And a lot of it had to do with what happened in the mid-1970s. Enter the World Football League. Amazing Schoolhouse Rock style animation intro aside, the WFL was a complete and utter disaster. But there was one team that was head and shoulders above the rest during the 74 season, both on the field and off the field with attendance. And that was the Birmingham Americans. During that 1974 season, Birmingham drew the highest average attendance of any team in the WFL. Now while many teams most notably the Philadelphia Stars, had inflated their numbers with free tickets, this wasn't really the case with Birmingham. Their numbers were fairly legit, and the Americans ended up averaging over 37,000 fans per game that season. Considering the rest of the league was in utter disarray, including two teams folding midway through and two teams relocating midway through, and this was really good. Birmingham was playing their games on Wednesday nights. Now that's not exactly an ideal time to play games if you're trying to draw big crowds. But despite this, they were still pulling in fairly large numbers. And by WFL standards, their numbers were fantastic. But if you take Birmingham's attendance numbers and put them in the NFL, they still hold up surprisingly well. I went through each team's attendance figures during the 1974 season, one by one. And surprisingly enough, Birmingham's average WFL attendance wouldn't have ranked last in the league in 1974. They drew better crowds on average than the Houston Oilers and the Baltimore Colts. And they drew pretty comparable crowds to the San Diego Chargers and Atlanta Falcons. And again, they were playing in a minor league on Wednesday nights. So even though the WFL went down as quickly as it went up, eyes were starting to shift towards Birmingham as a pro football hotbed. If they generated all that support for a team in a shoddy league, imagine what they'd do if they had an NFL team. Alongside Memphis, Birmingham applied for an expansion team in the NFL, as Commissioner Pete Rozelle seriously considered adding two more teams for the 1978 season. But after the league opted not to expand, they tried their efforts at luring a team through relocation. And Vikings GM Mike Lynn announced that if they didn't get their new stadium, that they would consider leaving Minnesota. And with the team's lease at the Met ending after the 1979 season, Vikings owner Max Winner was in discussions with officials from Birmingham. But in the end, nothing materialized. Winner and Lynn and company got what they wanted a brand new stadium in the Metrodome. The Vikings would leave the Met after the 81 season, with the final game ever there being a 10-6 defeat to the Kansas City Chiefs. And I'm willing to bet this is the only time in NFL history that fans stormed the field in celebration following a loss. And in 1982, the Vikings began play in their brand new 
domed facility. Metropolitan Stadium was left abandoned, and Birmingham was left without an NFL team. But nearly two decades later, Birmingham got a second chance. Let's fast forward to the second half of the 1990s. The Vikings were consistently in the thick of things on the field during this time period. They had a 10-season stretch where they didn't finish below 500, and they made the playoffs eight times in a nine-year period. Even though they didn't make a Super Bowl during that time frame, they were putting a good product on the field year after year. But off the field, things weren't looking so hot. And a large part of it had to do with the Metrodome. Even though they were winning games, the Vikings were bleeding money compared to the rest of the league. On December 19th, 1996, the Vikings made a presentation to the Metropolitan Sports Facilities Commission, showing just how much trouble they were in. I was able to obtain some charts from that presentation, and let's just say that after going through some of these, you'll see just how dire the Viking situation truly was under their Metrodome lease. The Vikings had lost money on their football operations over the previous five seasons, and in 1995, excluding Jacksonville and Carolina, the two expansion teams, they ranked 24th out of 28 teams in the league in revenue. Their ticket prices were below the rest of the league. They were receiving no advertising money. They were receiving no concession money. And as part of their lease, they were receiving no parking money. And remember, the Vikings were winning games at this point. It's not like they were going 2-14 and 3-13 and and every single season and failing to sell out. They were a competitive team year in and year out. They were a team that over a 15-year stretch during this time had just one season below 500. If on-the-field performance was anything to go off of, their position in terms of revenue should not have been declining. As the report summarized at the end, the Vikings' present lease agreement is among the worst in the NFL. To make a long story short, they wanted out. And to make matters worse, the league was growing tired of the Vikings' ownership structure. Minnesota had 10 owners, each of whom owned 10% of the team. Commissioner Paul Tagliabue wanted each team in the league to have an owner with at least a 30% stake. And for the Vikings, this wasn't the case. There were too many cooks in the kitchen. So because of this, the Vikings were looking to sell. And you can pretty much see where this might be going. The team wants out of their current stadium agreement, and the team is looking for a new owner. That is a prime recipe for relocation, especially considering how tumultuous the 1990s were in the league with regards to relocation. In just a three-season stretch, the Raiders moved back to Oakland, the Rams moved to St. Louis, the Browns moved to Baltimore, and the Oilers moved to Tennessee. Teams were packing their bags left, right, and center, and it looked like the Vikings would be no different. So once again, Birmingham threw their hat into the ring. Dr. Larry Lemick, a Birmingham surgeon, was the main guy interested in buying the team. And there had been meetings between representatives from the city and the Vikings about possibly bringing football down to Alabama. At this point, Birmingham was still considered a hotbed for professional football, even as the WFL was long gone. In 1991, they got a team in the World League of American Football called the Birmingham Fire. And in 1995, they got the Birmingham Barracudas in the Canadian Football League. If Lemmick got his way, then Birmingham would have a team in the National Football League. But as you can probably tell, this never materialized. Legion Field was more than suitable for NFL games during the first bid back in the 1970s. But in the 1990s, times had changed. Birmingham would have needed a new stadium. And preferably, they wanted a domed venue, and the Alabama Sports Foundation wasn't fully behind the idea 
of building this stadium. So in the end, the Vikings sold the team to San Antonio businessman Red McCombs, who kept the team in Minnesota before selling the team to Ziggy Wolf a few years later once his bid to replace the Metrodome fell through. Twice, Birmingham tried to lure the Vikings. And both times, they couldn't do it. Birmingham is still a pretty hot market for upstart football leagues. In 2001, they got a team in the XFL. And during the only season of the Alliance of American Football this year, they had a team. Birmingham is still trying to get an NFL team. Earlier this offseason, they tried to bring the Raiders over for a temporary venue option if the Vegas stadium wasn't ready. We'll see how their future efforts wind up. But as for the Vikings, they are now comfortably in Minnesota. After years and years of relocation rumors, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. But we were so close to having the Birmingham Vikings. Twice.